Let's get inside the mind of a serial entrepreneur. We have a round two conversation today on the podcast. A round two series is when we bring back not just one of my favorite guests, but one of your favorite guests to have a follow-up conversation. Today we're sitting down with Jacob Fries. Jacob Fries is absolutely the definition of a serial entrepreneur. He's owned a multitude of businesses in the past two decades, most notably in recent years. You might have ventured over to Siloam Springs and had a tasty burger with an onion ring on top over at Barnett's Dairyette. Or you may have bought some fireworks this past holiday from Fries Fireworks. He's an incredible business person and has so many great insights. Let's talk about the world of entrepreneurship on today's show. Before we dive in, though, here's a word from one of the amazing businesses that sponsors the podcast. Check this out. We'll be right back soon. There's one single piece of advice that I give to business owners who are ready to scale their business drastically, and that's knowing exactly what you need to hand off so that you can continue focusing on what you're an expert in. It amazes me when I talk to business owners who are doing their own bookkeeping and tax prep. And worse, that they're going through all this paperwork at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, even midnight, slaving away trying to make sense of all of the numbers for their business. Business owners who are making it happen have already figured out that you can't do it all yourself. That's why I recommend Steve Lay with Equity Business Solutions. Not only is he an expert in bookkeeping and tax prep, but what I love about Steve is that he'll sit down with you and help you make sense of the value of your business beyond just reading a spreadsheet. You'll be able to make better decisions, and more importantly, you're going to save yourself the crucial time you would have spent going through QuickBooks or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is that keeps us up late at night. So save yourself some time and some money by giving Steve Lay a call at Equity Business Solutions, and he'll show you the value beyond your numbers. Go to EquityBusinessSolutionsLLC.com to find out more. Jacob, it's great to have you back on the podcast today. So good to be back. Thank you. You are now officially part of the round two club. Nice. The people who, like I said, nice, like what does that even mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm honored. I'm truly honored. Yeah, the because... people who I, I love having people back on the show. And so especially someone like you who, um, you know, for our listeners that we had the intro with someone who's a lifelong entrepreneur who has his hands in a multitude of businesses. Um, it's always a such a net positive to have someone on the show who has such rich background, such a rich background in business. Um, and I like talking with you too. So it's Thank an you. added plus. But yeah. uh, now you're just coming off of now for one of your businesses, you're just coming off a pretty busy season with yes. freeze fireworks. Um, 20 locations. Yes, is that right? That's correct. You grew from four. That's correct. Last year. Yeah. So this is our fifth year in okay. business. Uh, we'd predominantly been four to six locations last year. We were four in 2023 and this year we, we were almost 22 had hmm. two, two land deals fall apart at the last minute. And so we ended up with 20. So are you just a glutton for punishment or, <laughs> cause I know you probably, it was probably a lot to manage all of these locations and they weren't all local no nope. either three states yeah yeah so like walk me through um you know you had the four locations did you how did you settle on the 22 and then eventually the 20 was it, ooh, I like that location? Like, what was your process for kind of figuring all that out? Really, it came down to resources um, because my original goal from the end of 2023 season was, okay, I'm going to buy 10 tents. I had never owned my tents before. I'd always rented. Uh, I'm going to buy 10, and we're going to get to 10 locations. Well, then we put together an order for three uh, containers. Was, this was the first time I was doing direct importing as well. And as I really started to dive into the numbers of the three containers of inventory that was coming. I was like, okay, either A, I've got to also become a wholesaler because I need to unload some of this inventory to, to really cash flow or B, we're just going to grow it. Um, and so I ended up uh, like all of a sudden in like January or February, I had 15 operators and I only had 10 land deals. And so I'm like, well, hey, we can do this. I, I can get to 20. We'll do 20. And, and 20 was really the, the number that worked out well to where we didn't have to become a wholesaler. And that's just a whole nother animal in the business. And so I didn't really want to go there just yet. And so, yeah, in, in January, February, I was like, okay, we've got 15 operators. We I just need five more operators and I need 10 more land deals. And so as I was going through my list of kind of once uh, what areas I wanted to be in, 
I started looking down the list and I'm like, hey, I've got really another 20 that I want to be in. And so we can easily, you know, knock this out. And so I saw you on your potential locations. You mentioned Kansas City, which is my neck of the woods, um, or rather my wife's neck of the woods. So I was excited about that. Um, For the brief time that I've known you, so you've come on the podcast before. I guess we've known each other for maybe um, maybe a year, maybe a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, you've always seemed to be so um, optimistic and um, like the world is my oyster. Is that the right expression? Uh, or, yeah, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> People yeah. tell me, no, yeah. I never say the expression right. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think about freeze fireworks going to 40 locations. You have the um, Tint and Bounce company that you started as well. Yep. Um, walk me through like your personality. You just don't seem very skittish about risk and trying new things and you know, how many businesses do you have, by the way, now? Well, I, I kind of lost. I always lose track. I, it, I think it's it, about it's at least ca- a dozen. Yeah, right? well, cash flowing businesses or entities, you yeah, know, yeah. kind of varies. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest thing for me, is, and that's one of my downfalls, honestly, is is wanting to always start new businesses. Mm-hmm. I need and I've I've decided over the last probably three to six months, like I need to start focusing and and cash flowing some of these a little bit more healthy um, before I start anymore. Um, and so but Tent and Bounce was a natural progression of fireworks because uh, in 2023, we tested bounce houses um, at three Arkansas locations and we rented them and it went over really well. And so in the off season, I bought 10 bounce houses and, and that's just, you know, my wife will kind of <laughs> yell at me for that. But I, I just bought 10 bounce I've houses. I've seen your warehouse. Yeah. You got the space yeah, for it. Yeah, you got the space. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, one of the things I did that I shouldn't have was I didn't look into the insurance of it all beforehand. Um, and it oh, blew yeah. me away to find out that bounce house insurance was going to be more expensive than the fireworks insurance. Oh, my goodness. And so I'm like, well, I'm only going to be using them for like 10 days. And they're like, doesn't matter. You've got to pay a full, you know, annual uh, rate. And so I was like, well, we've, we've bought the tents now. We've got the bounce houses. And so we just need to create another company to, to make this insurance make sense. And so that's kind of, that makes more sense than some of my other random businesses that I've started. <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it ambition? Is it boredom? Is it curiosity? Like what, what drives you? Um, cause I, I don't think it's just starting new businesses. I think it's like, yeah, we're going to go from 20 locations to 40 locations with freeze fireworks. You know, there's something about you that I think that's really enjoyable to, um, to observe and chat with you about. And I'm curious cause you know, a lot of people listening, we have some people on the show who they're not actually running a business. They're not actually an entrepreneur. They're a entrepreneur. You know, they want, they right. love the idea right. of entrepreneurship and they're listening right now. Maybe they're driving home from their, you know, their commute and they're thinking about the business they're going to start one day. And I don't mean this in any harsh way to any one of our listeners, but for some people that will just forever be the one day thing they never do. You haven't just pulled the trigger. Um, And I think you've been an entrepreneur for my my whole life. This isn't a recent thing. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm just, I'm so interested in that like personality trait and you, you joked about it being your downfall. I think it's a very, um, it's a very, um, I can't say attractive, which is kind of a weird way to put it, <laughs> but it's just, it's, it's a very compelling characteristic that I'm very, I'm interested in, um, which maybe that's just part of your personality. Maybe you've just always been a risk taker. And I, I think that is definitely, yeah, okay. you know, one of the things in my, you know, early late teens, early twenties, I was a risk taker in rock climbing, ice climbing, uh, motor racing, you know, that sort of thing. I think as I got older, I needed to find something less physical to be, yeah, sure. to, uh, to be aggressive at. Um, but you know, I'll talk to the entrepreneur, honestly, because there is a lot of people that I see that have pulled the trigger on quitting their job and going all in on a business. And then they realize, Oh, hey, man, this is way harder than I realized. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the stress of entrepreneurship, uh, it it never stops. Right. Um, you know, they always say it's lonely at the top. Well, I think about that constantly now because I'm always in the office by myself, you know, after hours, uh, 8, 9, 10 p.m., some, some nights, some nights later. Um, but... 
it really is lonely and you have to be really driven uh, in your purpose. And that's why, you know, in the last three to six months, it's been like, okay, I need to take a step back a little bit. Maybe I need to ease up on the stress because I literally almost went bankrupt this year um, oh trying to get to this Just uh, so many different season. things going. Well, and, and because, you know, with fireworks, you've got to eventually, I mean, you don't have to buy the tents, but you've either got to buy the tents or find a big enough tent rental company that can support your growth. Um, you've got to buy the tables. Tables sounds like a most ridiculous thing, but I spent $30,000 on tables this year. And I was going to say, also, I think about some of your updates on Facebook of, um, I, I, I can't remember if you were getting the tables or you were, you were like driving oh, yeah. a trailer. I decided to go to Canada. Yeah. And just went pick to Canada. Them up. yeah. yeah. Like these are the things that I think a lot of people, uh, you made the comment of um, people don't realize how hard it is. And I think that's really honestly true. Probably the biggest group of people that I blast on social media are like the salesy digital marketers who talk about like, you know, why haven't you started your business yet? It's so easy. You know, the, the path to a million dollars is 30 days away, all this kind of stuff. But they don't see the person driving 18 plus hours and I think you also had a picture recently on um, like the mileage, yes, the miles that you yes. had driven. In six weeks, I did yeah. ninety three hundred miles. Um, you know, delivering. So I bought a container for every location this year. So that was another expense we had. I have a uh, one tripper, nice container for each location uh, to house the inventory and such. And so not only delivering that container out to the location, but then coming to pick it up at the end of the season. And so yeah, ninety three hundred miles uh, between three states in six weeks and. A lot of driving. So what keeps you from like quitting? Mm. What, what keeps you from being like, this is, I'm done. This is, because you're right, the stress. I think here, here's also the thing I think is really interesting that has, um, and th this could be, I could be, I'm willing to be wrong here for our listeners, but I was talking to someone the other day about this where I was talking about how there's no boundaries in entrepreneurship in the sense of, now, obviously you all the cliche, like, you know, you set your own boundary, all that kind of stuff, whatever. But, um, you know, if, if I need to talk with a customer, I'll, I'll be sending an email at 10 o'clock at night. Yep. Um, just, that's just my pacing. I don't, I just don't wait. Now they don't, I don't expect them to get back to me right then, but I just have a very quick pacing and it infiltrates a lot of my life. Yep. Well, I was talking to a guy who he was like, Hey, you know, you should really make your work day, uh, nine to four, nine to five, and like really protect that. And I, I get where he was coming from. I, I understand it, but as I was also thinking you're not a business owner. And so for you, it's like this neat and tidy, like it's just like a job, but it's just you work for yourself. Right. And it's not that neat and tidy. And a lot of people don't see what you're talking about, driving all those miles, the expenses that you never account for. I mean, $30,000 in tables, right? you know? Uh, which where are those tables <clears throat> right now, by the way? Are they in the warehouse? They're or? in a container. So okay. I have them divvied out into the individual containers. Yep. Yeah. So what what keeps you, despite all the, um, I'll just call it noise, because it's not all bad, but despite all the noise, um, what do you what do you center yourself on? Like how do you how do you wake up and stay ambitious and motivated? Um, I've just always thought of you as a very positive person. Yeah. So like what keeps you, what keeps that drive, that fire alive? You know, first of all, I want to speak to the, um, you know, the hours. Um, so I was, I was actually on a, a Q and a zoom call with Gary V uh, yeah. just the other day, which was yeah. super cool. Um, you know, and he was saying, you know, it's the old cliche, you, you love what you do and you don't work a day in your life. Well, I mean, th the 80 hours plus that I work every week, um, I wouldn't say are are grueling. There are certain times when it's grueling. It's yeah. it's like, man, when you're seeing the bank account getting low, yeah, you know, right. in one particular business or your personal account, um, yeah. you know, that starts to get a little grueling. Um, but you know, because I choose what I'm going to be doing uh, ultimately, you know, all my businesses. I, I do enjoy every one of them, and it, and it is kind of a cliche to say that, but um, I I don't have any interest in ever retiring. I want to work until the day I die, literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, obviously, as I get older, then that work looks different. Yeah. Um, but it's still going to be things that I enjoy doing every day, and I want to go into an office every day, and and I'm just old fashioned like that, and mm -hmm. and you know do those things, and so it does get taxing, it does get grueling at times, uh, but you know during fire season um i was probably i probably worked 100 hours a week you know for three weeks um 
But at the same time, I was I was going to bed at one o'clock, getting up at seven, and I'm not a morning person. We just discussed that, um, you know, getting up at seven, getting less than six hours of sleep, and I am the type of person that needs a solid eight hours of sleep, you know. But I did that for three weeks, and really, it was it was not that big of a deal because yeah. I was just so invigorated. I was like, yes, you know, my projections were doing it, we're hitting it. Yeah. Uh, now, however, you know, one thing that I wanted to talk about today on the podcast too is at you go to a couple. There's a couple industry conventions for fireworks um you can't ever get a straight answer out of anyone and that is rare at an industry convention usually I, i've been in many industries usually you go and it's just free-flowing information and they're just you know talking about numbers and pnls and you know all these things at the fireworks conventions it is the opposite everybody is, it, is very more cutthroat tight. yes or? and that's why because everybody is so tight-lipped because you could literally go and put a tent right next to the oh i've seen it fourth <laughs> of july yeah you yes. see the one on this side and one on this side yes and so i think that's why why it is, um, it's it's really unfortunate though because um, there's so many things. Well, I guess it's just one of those things. You you have to learn it by doing it, and and so I actually uh, had a really good conversation with somebody that's in the tent and bounce house business uh, that lives out in Oregon, and he's interested in fireworks. I'm like, hey man, let's just dive into this. You know, I'll tell you all these things that are going on. He's like wow, thank you so much for warning me about some of these things that are going to yeah. happen. And um, because you just don't get that. And and so that's that's one of the things that um, I, I like to talk about. I'll talk about numbers and I'll talk about, you know, I might keep a couple things close to the vest, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, some things that I've kind of figured out that other well, people you, have. It, but. You don't have to be like entirely transparent. Right. You know, I'm not going to pull out like, you know, let's talk about my cash flow of the last 30 days with, you know, competitor, I guess. But I will say I have found it to be a net positive to link hands with my competitors because I have found that it's actually when a customer is not a good fit, sending that customer to that person and vice versa and like really realizing our strengths. <clears throat> and I've noticed that's definitely because there's sort of a, a local feel to that here. Um, but it's also, I guess it's a little bit different in my industry. You know, really when you think about the fireworks industry, it's like you said, you can drive down the street and literally, I mean, there are, and I don't even know like permits and like land permits and like how all that works, but, um, it's also a bit interesting. I have to assume some of these aren't even local companies. No, no. Some of them are very large. Well, <laughs> They tend to be regional, I feel like. So, yeah, okay. you know, one of my major competitors is the largest importer in the country. They happen to be in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Um, so, you know, they're they're pretty close by. Uh, but, yeah, for the most part, they're regional. There's a couple of national players, but only like two yeah. in the entire industry. And so, yes, definitely competing with uh, some out-of-state money as well and big money. Yeah. And so, you know, those are the things. But, um, you know, as you... You know, here's the other thing I, I would like to talk about, if you don't mind. So, you know, people ask me all the time, oh, I hear you just kill it in fireworks. No, you don't. It's kind of like any other business. Yeah. I mean, if you do it at a small scale, one or two locations, you could maybe work out if you're working it yourself. It's always such a, a weird, um, I, I get I get in such a weird place because I think about where my business is and it's, I would call it successful in the sense of like, it pays the bills and we aren't broke. Right. But it is such like a micro of like where I eventually want to be. And you and I have talked, we've had lunch in the past about like wealth and like where we want to be financially, like long term. It is so short of that. And it's always such a weird feeling when you talk to someone, they're like, man, you are crushing it. You're killing it. Man, you're doing so well. Or yeah. I had a guy who I ran into the day who he was introducing me to someone and he goes, this is Blake. He's Mr. LinkedIn. And I thought my LinkedIn is so tiny comparatively. It's so tiny. But it's funny to me, like these people, I, I think I've found on that same conversation of people who are too scared to start a business, I think a lot of people are, um, maybe they kind of hyper-focus on people's success and what momentum they're seeing rather than understanding that it is a business like any other business and it is a grind, yeah, positive or negative, like any other grind. Um, and I guess when people compliment me in that way, I always feel this need to not like warn people. But just to kind of like bring it down a little bit of like, well, it's it is a job. So it, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And then I don't know if you get this too, but then I also get the other people who they're like, Are you still doing that thing? And I'm like, Yeah, it's it's a real business. You know, and they're like, Oh, okay, cool. It's not like a hobby thing. And I'm like, right. I was I had a, a person on my podcast and they were like, So like, how do you get paid? Cause like they came on the podcast for free. She got like, What's your job? And I was like, Well, this is my job. It's 
the podcast is part of my business. She's like, you have a business? And I was like, we've known each other for years. Like, yeah, yeah, I do. But that's funny. Anyway, but so yeah. is your son entrepreneurial? Um, you know, he, I don't know. I don't know yet. He's, he's a, a young 17 year old. He still has no idea what he wants to do, uh, you know, after high school, which I've told him, you know, totally fine. Does you want to go to college? Um, not necessarily interested in college. And so, uh, I, I feel like uh, his path is going to be the family business in some way, shape or form. Uh, but no, he doesn't, it doesn't necessarily show any interest in, in starting his own business of any sort. Are you uh, in the, um, there's such an interesting, like pronounced <laughs> camp of pro college for like long-term career and anti-college sounds a little bit too. Ooh, I could talk on this. For yeah. Days. <laughs> I want to, I want to open the, open the can a little bit if I can. Yeah. I, for anti-college sounds a little bit harsher than I mean it, but just people who are like, Hey, I just long-term success. I don't see the value here. Um, can I, can I put you on the spot? Yeah, and absolutely. Hear a bit oh, about... I could talk about this for days. Yeah. So, you know, I have uh, predominantly been blue collar my whole life. I mean, my, I grew up in the construction business with my dad. Um, you know, as we talked about earlier, uh, being in the lawn and landscape business in my 20s and then eventually getting into the restaurant business. Um, I, I think... Thank goodness, finally, we're seeing a shift to where even the high school administrators are seeing like, hey, we don't need to cram college down every single person's throat. Mm -hmm. I think they're finally seeing, hey, trade school is a good option. And oh, by the way, plumbers are making $85 to $100 an hour, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think that's really good to see. But so I think I'm if, not going to bad mouth anybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, and I think about when I was a high school teacher, this would have been over 10 years ago, but we had a really great welding program. And I remember there was like this push to get some of our kids to basically like go to school and like take out loans, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, well, hang on. Like if they get their welding license, like their starting pay is almost 100K. Yeah. So this is a very lucrative, valuable direction for them to look at rather than just like, oh, yeah, it's just got to. Now, in our case, this was a school where like a big metric for the school's success was like college acceptance and like right, right. kind of these more like arbitrary numbers. Which but, is sad, honestly. Yeah. And I hope that those those kind of, you know, uh, numbers are are set aside these days. But, you know, um, I I just think about the in my mind, college is only for a very select few. And I don't even think it should be for corporate people, honestly. I think they need to get rid of the the mandatory bachelor's degree to, to get into the corporate world. Um, because there's so many industry seminars that you can learn and actually go for a few days or a week and mm -hmm. learn exactly what you need to learn instead of sit in classes for four years and learn a bunch of stuff that you don't need to learn. Mm -hmm. And so of course there's very specific ones, doctors, veterinarians, <laughs> you know, they <laughs> need to you. go to school. Yeah. Um, but there's just, I, I'm, I'm glad to see the shift. Um, I don't know if it's, it's a hundred percent there yet. I think for those kids that aren't necessarily blue collar or blue collar thinking, they're probably in this kind of gray area where maybe they're getting forced to go, to, you know, or pushed to go to school, even though they have no clue what they want to do. I mean, how many people do we know that are in the industry where their degree I, is? I, I knew mean, you were going to say that. Yeah, I knew just, you were going to say that. I don't know anyone who uses what they got their degree on. Yeah. I was a biology major. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like, it's funny, like I was talking to a guy, this would have been a couple years ago, but he's like, where'd you get your MBA? And I was like, I never, I never got one. I never went to business school. I don't know anything about any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, I just know what I've learned along the way, but, um, yeah, yeah most people I talk to and, and, and having now to talk out of both sides of my mouth, I mean, I'd love, I'd love for my kids to go to college or at least have the option to go if they want to. Right. Um, but yeah, most people I know, they don't use the degree that they actually went to school for. Right. Uh, and I've also found that many, like when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, it's like you said, you just really deeply don't know what it is you want to Man, do. I'm 47 now. Yeah. And I think about <laughs> even I, I, I'm working with a, a, a young man. Uh, I say young man, he's 27. Um, that is in finance at Sam's club. He's helping me with my inventory on fireworks and is going to continue to do that. Um, but I think about even him at his age, like, Man, he's so young. Mm -hmm. I I just it blows my mind. I'm becoming that 
that old man that I used to talk to <laughs> or hear, you know, in, yeah. in the back of my head um, of of tw- in 20s and 30s even. Yeah. You know, you're so young. And so for for people to expect to, to know what they want to do, like my son, yeah. when he's 17, that's impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, they might have a great idea what they want to do for the next 10 years. Yeah. You know, if some people, my son doesn't. Yeah. Um, but for them to to know this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I've got to have my degree in it, you mm-hmm. know, to make it happen. Uh, it's I just... mean, I didn't, I was 30 when I started good advice. I mean, I, and I didn't even know I really liked business until I was maybe 28, you know? So uh, a lot of this stuff comes along so much later. And it's another, you mentioned Gary Vee, another piece of content I really resonate with him is, which is not even targeted at me, but um, the path of your professional career Like we think of it in terms of like twenties and thirties and it's so much more common to fully come into like what you want to do in your late thirties, forties. And one thing he talks about, he he addresses a lot of content towards 50 plus year olds of, Hey, you're you're not out of time. I was getting ready to say the same thing. I love hearing that because he's, he's very consistent with that message. Mm -hmm. And so I hear it all the time on, on some of his social content, he'll be sitting there talking, you know, very candidly with somebody that came to one of his seminars and like, you know, maybe they're 45 or or pushing 50 and they're like, Oh my gosh, Gary, I've got to start all over. Like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. First of all, you're not starting all over because you're 45. You yeah. know, you have all this wealth of knowledge that you've gained up to this point. Mm-hmm. Now, you have a whole nother 45 years easy mm-hmm. to make this happen. And and so I, I like that also because, you know, listening to another... Um, uh, Benjamin Hardy book, uh, the Who Not How is one of them that we were talking about earlier today. But there's another book um, where... <laughs> Dan Sullivan is the guy that actually, you know, produces the content and he talks about taking entrepreneurs in his training classes and okay, you're this age. Now, let's let's decide how long you're going to live and then let's walk backwards and figure that out. And that's I when I listen to that in that book, it really finally hit me like, hey, I'm 47, but you know what? I've easily got 45 years, if not more, on this earth. Yeah. Because I'm going to take care of my body, first of all. Yeah. So that's going to be, you know, number I just one knew goal. You would, you would be the guy to be like, yeah, 100 easy, for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and so, you know, but, but you know, he talks about all that stuff, not only just in business, but yeah. you taking care of your health and like aging well and things of that yeah. nature. And so, yeah, you have so much time on this earth, you really don't think about it. Although I will say at 47, I just turned 47 a couple of weeks ago. Um, it does kind of start to hit you like, man, I am definitely not young anymore, but I'm not old. I'm not old. I'm not going to say I'm old. <laughs> yeah. You look in the mirror, you're like, man, I got so much gray in my beard. When did this happen? I think for me, like I saw a patch of gray in my beard and I thought, man, have I really been that stressed over? And then I'm like, yeah, yeah, I have been. Um, something else you said that I really liked was, um, not, I feel like we do this so often discounting our experience. Like, oh, I'm starting over. I'm starting from scratch. And I had a friend of mine who runs a marketing company. Um, I guess my camera just died. Um, a friend of mine runs a marketing company who, um, she her journey was like stereotypical. Like she grinded for 10, 15 years and now it's a, it's a million dollar plus business. Took a long time to get there. Her husband quit his job, started his own consulting company. And I think it's like around 300, 400K and he's been in business for maybe a year. So we were talking about those two stories of her, like she rented this one tiny bedroom apartment, uh, tiny one bedroom apartment. It was like behind a water tower. It was like this dilapidated building. I mean, you know, roaches, all this. It's like the story, right? And her husband who's had like immediate success. And so she was positioning those two stories at each other and said, you know, a lot of times we think that no matter where we are in our career, like we have to start from scratch. Well, for my husband, the reason he was able to see that success is because he had 20 years of like deep sales experience and like an incredible network. So he started his business in his late forties and he's able to leverage all of that success that I didn't have when I was in my mid twenties. Right. And I think a lot of times we, we take that approach of just like, Oh, like, what can I do? What do I know? And we really sort of diminish all the things we're bringing to the table. Well, and you know, not just your experience in business either, you know, your experience in life can help you in a, in a future career. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think about, uh, my wife's in real estate. I think about young 
realtors versus maybe middle-aged, you know, so to speak, realtors, they have so many more life experiences. They've been through these processes, whereas young, straight out of college uh, realtors, they've maybe never done a a real estate transaction in their life, so they have no idea what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And so they have a lot more learning to do to go through those processes. But yeah, I think that's with everything, though. Yeah. Well, Jacob, we're actually out of time. We've come to the end of our, our conversation today. So fast. Um, I know. It always goes so quick. We need to have a round three, okay. honestly, because I feel like we just got yes. into it. But so as we wrap up, um, I set on 40 locations next year. When does the season start for you, by the way? Well, officially, you can sell in some states and cities uh, June 20th. Okay. Um, but okay. we, we typically try to push that back. Those first few days are very dead. Yeah, okay. and there's not much much reason to be open, but uh, yeah. So, forty locations is the goal for 2024, and then you have uh, Barnett's Dairy yet mm-hmm. in Siloam. Yep. Uh, and then, are there any other businesses you want to mention to our? Uh, yeah, without opening the <laughs> opening without, the box, like, where should I start? Yeah. yeah. No, just the Tent and Bounce. You yeah. know, Tent and right. Bounce NWA. Um, we're really excited about that because we have a lot to offer. Uh, yeah. With things that we for the most part already had um but they're brand new yeah. so you know we have some nice quality uh things to rent out so who people... doesn't love a bouncy house yes any any birthday party we go to my kids are like is there going to be a bouncy house there yes so nice. i'll just have to call you and make sure there will be <laughs> so they're actually pretty affordable <laughs> yes honestly they are, very much yep. i think uh, which i don't know your rates but i think um my we went to a birthday party recently and i think you said it was like 200 bucks or something yep um, so, you can get a very basic bounce house for two yeah, bucks. And it, and it, yeah. Of course, now so, they make these huge slides that are like, yeah. we have a 15 footer, but they make some that are like 35 feet tall now. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. They're a little heavy. But <laughs> anything gives me an excuse to go through a bouncy house with my kids. I'm all about it. So, anyway, Jacob, thanks for coming on the show today. I thanks really Thanks so much appreciate for having it. me. Yeah. Hey, if you're listening for the first time, what the heck you wait on? Click that subscribe or follow button so you can keep getting good advice wherever you are. We're going to put Jacob's contact information in our episode description. And if you're listening to the show and you want to support the show or you want to advertise your business on the show, you can always reach out at Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com where you can join our Patreon, patreon.com slash goodadvice for as little as $5 a month. Thanks so much to our supporters of the show. We'll be back soon. That's today's good advice. We'll catch you later. See ya.